Choralist live, and we're having um, Bongani Drama Namtoya uh, in the program today. And um, I'm hosting on behalf of Mr. Njeza, who happens to be away today. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to have um, an, an exciting conversation with Mr. Namtoya. He's going to be talking specifically about um, the introduction of aspects of indigeneity into um, choral music and opera in South Africa, and also is trying to figure out or think through ways in which these elements of um, indigeneity in vocal production and also performance can, can, can be integrated, but also what it means to teach them, um, what it means to, um, to, 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 to work through them within a genre that is basically not always regarded as, as, as African. So we're going to hear from him. Um, just a little bit of introduction about who Mr. Nabutoya or Bongani drama is. Um, Bongani was born in Pochestrum and was raised in Soweto, 
And then he attended uh, the TUT Vocal Arts uh, School, and he holds a master's degree in opera studies. And on his, op and on his master's thesis, he was writing about um, African op operas that have been uh, composed since uh, 2004, or since, not 2004, sorry, since 1994, the dawn of the new age. And also, um, Mr. Namtua is, is very much um, a versatile artist who does a lot of emceeing, a lot of live streaming, especially in the NCF um, platform, the National Choir Festival platform. He's on TV, he's on radio, he does emceeing. He's also a very seasoned um, tenor singer, uh, tenor soloist. He has appeared in a number of pro pro uh, operatic productions and has been a member of opera companies in this country. So we welcome him and we are looking forward to having a conversation with him. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Bogwana. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Bongani? I'm well, thank you. And good afternoon to everyone watching as well. Thank you so much for uh, having me on the call this afternoon. Right. Welcome. Welcome. It's so exciting to have you here. Um, we used to see we used to seeing you um, giving very insightful commentary on the NCF live streams. So, what have you got for us today? All right. So, um, you know, this is a, I think a conversation that uh, so many people have been having, and I think I saw Mr. Kivi Badi Avo touching on it on Facebook, and uh, during the course of my study, I then also discovered the fact that that conversation was so, sort of sparked here and there. So basically what I'm trying to get into um, is just the introduction of the teaching of even the basic, you know, uh, type of African indigenous uh, technique of singing. You know, you have uh, the Italian uh, type of singing, you have the German, you have the French type of singing that use obviously their own dialects, you know, of uh, sort of, of speech that is impeded in, in into, uh, you know, the type of singing that they do themselves as well. But obviously, maybe let's start by defining what indigenization is. Obviously, you know, it's uh, something that uh, grows at a particular place or area and also sort of absorbs, you know, the, uh, the types of things that are also just around it as well. But African singing is often includes, obviously, the glissandos, the slides, where are sometimes known as the portamento. And obviously the slurs, there's whistles, there's yodels and swaps and all types of sounds as well, uh, you know, such as the uh, rhapsody and uh, buzz quality that the African, you know, type of singing would have. Now, the melodies in African music are organized within a scale of four, five to six or even seven notes, right? Now, they tend to use small melodic intervals, uh, lots of second and thirds, and often use, you know, recurring patterns and also, uh, you know, discerning phrases as well. Now, African songs, uh, you know, are songs for every occasion, as we'll know it in weddings, you know, you'd have African songs at a funeral, you'd have African songs, uh, lullabies as well, you know, even for, for uh, political and also, you know, tribal occasions that we have as well. Now, uh, songs include accompanied and unaccompanied as well. Uh, choruses are, you know, example of a cappella singing. Uh, songs are usually either strophic, that's obviously split in two, um, uh, you know, in two verses, or in a call and response form. I think if if I could make a quick example about the the, the call and response form, is one you'd or you'd find with Otadabe, uh, uh, you know, uh, Black Mambazo. Uh, where the leader sings a line, which is a call, and then the call will then come through to answer, uh, you know, what the call was, to respond to this call. We also see it in, you know, our choral works where, uh, you know, you'd find, uh, you know, uh, either the soloist calling and then the, the um, chorus will then respond, uh, you know, to all of that. Now, there's often overlapping between the leader and the chorus. The chorus part is usually very much homophonic in black chords. All right. Typical, obviously, of African music. All right. Now, during the start, my study, because I looked at the inclusion of uh, indigenous content in opera post 1994, and also dealt and argued so much regarding then this, you know, uh, art form that's obviously not indigenous, um, you know, not not indigenously from Africa, and seeing how we can indigenize it. 
by including elements of indigenization in the content. And I came up with a conclusion to say, you know, that um, in as much as this is not our art form, however, but if you do put in those elements in, then you sort of are indigenizing it. And why I had said that was because when I, when I attended Ziang Kom at uh, the State Theater, and a week prior, two weeks prior to that, I had attended mm -hmm. another um, opera, La Traviata, that was done by the Black Tan Ensemble. And I could see that majority of people, you know, um, were, were, was white, you know? And obviously understanding the history behind how opera was introduced in South Africa and how also you'd have all the audience members, um, you know, that I saw then. And having obviously subtitles and having the black audience not really understanding what's going on, but they're there to support their people that are, they're seeing on stage. But then two weeks to that, I then you know, watch Uzian Como. And I think there's a scene where uh, there's a backdrop and there's lighting and you have, uh, I think, uh, three male figures who are figuring a cow. And the other one is obviously then stabbing the cow with Kela, uh, you know, so it's slaughtered so that it, it can then be, be, be had as a feast. And I remember hearing just the, uh, the, the, the positive, um, the energy without anyone saying anything but in the room that people were understanding what really is happening you know but if you have something like uh, in a german or french opera and you have you know majority of black people uh, watching they'll probably just laugh at something that's probably not even you know something to laugh about in the opera so now during the course of my study i discovered 20 new operas that were produced since 1990 and represent some form of indigenization but now what I bump into is uh, an opera by uh, uh, Hans Hussein, um, and this opera is Mosque, you know, um, and it's an opera about mosques as well. Now, he was faced by a challenge, and this challenge was, you know, a particular problem when, when he asked, you know, some of the singers to produce a sound call singing in the crawl, which I suspect is what, what you know, the, uh, the, the Kosa, uh, you know, a type of singing uh, would have, uh, you know, uh, obviously taken from, from the instrument that, that, you know, the Kosa tradition plays. Now, to his shock over all of that, even the Black singers themselves couldn't produce the sound and they didn't even know what he means and what he's talking about because they come from a school of German uh, type of technique, a school of French technique, a school of, uh, you know, of, um, uh, of German technique, you know, French and Italian as well. So then it really does seem that it then became a problem. But also now the thing then becomes that how many operas are we going to produce so that we can have more of the African type of technique being taught in schools. That's basically where my conversation is going. All right. The the many the many thank you so much, Bongani. Thank you. There are many things here you've you've covered, and I think we need we need to unpack them very slowly. That okay. um, maybe the first thing that we we need to maybe the first thing that we need to think through when when we're talking about African opera or Af opera in Africa or indigenization of opera, maybe the first thing is Af African stories, um, stories that have got relevance to uh, to, to Africa and that, that have been taken. Hear me? I can sort of hear Hi. you a little bit. Are you, you just... Can you, can you hear me? You can, you can repeat it for me again. Okay. All right. I was saying. I was saying that perhaps we need to unpack the different levels of indigeneity within African opera, um, starting with the languages, which means um, African operas need to be composed in the languages that we speak, and and because of that, that necessitates the ways in which we sing. How we sing these operas should then. Um, be related to how we speak as Africans uh, in our different languages and dialects, which means that one must not come with a very um, Germanic or a Frenchified way of singing while you are singing in, in, in local languages. And so which means then you are saying we need to challenge, we need to develop new ways of thinking about vocal production, about diction, within the South African um, Academy in order to, to accommodate these different languages that people sing in. Completely. 
completely. Right. And uh, yeah, that's Okay, then I suppose then the, the next question is also because you're talking about how when um, they were they're about to slaughter a cow in this young government, there was a particular energy that people understood uh, because the storyline itself was very South African. So you, you are then suggesting that also one of the numerous ways to Africanize opera is to talk, is to take stories, is to take events from um, from the ground, so to speak, from locally, and write about things, write about our own histories, our own culture, our yeah. own heroes, our own stories, and so on. Completely, because this is this right. is you know it, Italians did it, how Germans did it as well when when they are composing. It's 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 things that they are related to. That's why you'd find more. It's Pearsons. It's people staying in in in, in huge uh, buildings. You know, uh, in most of the operas, and something that they can relate to. So if we can also. Uh, you know, try and, and I'm so glad and happy that you mentioned the fact that if we can go back to our stories and go back into composing, uh, you know, uh, uh, music for for in, in our own language because melody and I'll get into it a little bit later. The, one of the characteristics, obviously, of African music it, uh, when it comes to uh, the melody itself is that it is determined by the tonal inflections of the language. You know, yes, of definitely. Uh, uh, Definitely. So, so uh, uh, language or the uh, you know the, the semantic structure of the particular language or cultural group is it Kosa, is it Zulu, the Kumbichi Venda, etc. All right, that's that's very important. Which also then means, or rather, I'm curious, what would this mean in terms of the internet internationalization of our own operas? Um, does it mean that when we have produced these operas in local languages, we need also as we're trying to take them look, uh, abroad, we need also then to go and produce um, ways of speaking these languages, of singing in these languages, teach the Germans, teach the French that, look, here is opera from Africa and this is how it sounds. And in the same way that we've been disciplined to sing in Germanic or in Italianate or in English ways, then the rest of the world also needs to be disciplined and trained to sing in a in, in very Africanized way. What's your take on that? That is, that is um, what you're saying is very true, completely true. Because for me, I, I believe that, you know, we still have time to do it. And in as much as we have studied the way they do things, they are able to also, you know, study the way we do things. They will be able to take on a uh, Princess Malgogo score and try and learn the language and try and learn the, the technique that we have. Obviously now, it, it all obviously also would need to start from us, you know, the education system where this this uh, type of African technique of singing is then taught here with us so that by the time it then goes out there, we already know how, you know, we are, we are able to deal with it so that we're able to teach them as well so that they grasp it. It can take a few years, but it is something that is possible to be done because it was done to us. You know, we grasp it in, in four years when you're, when you're in school, you know, you're even luckier when, when you get more opportunities to even, you know, study further and get a, another singing teacher where you are taught the, the Italian type of singing that has its own dialect. Uh, I'm, I'm once again struggling with the connection. Oh. Right, I'm back. You're back as well. Right. Um, yeah, we, we just got cut for a second okay. there. But I can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, can you hear me? All right, wonderful. I think this is really exciting because within the academy, globally, we're talking about decolonization. And sometimes we talk about voices and pedagogies from the South. The South, of course, being... Um, you know, like this north-south divide uh, be between the developed and the developed world, and the whole idea of 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 decentering uh, pedagogies and no and, and and knowledge systems that have been taken from the colonizers and basically transplanted across the rest of the world. So I think your intervention and where it becomes exciting for me is that you are saying, let us look at the operatic industry, at the at the art song industry at the choral industry and start asking how can we indigenize, how can we contribute to the world based on our own um, understanding, based on our own authentic voices and authentic practices. Yeah. And, and you're saying that is also the same way that the Italians, the English, the Germans, the Russians have developed pedagogies for their own music and musicality and vocality. 
You're also mm -hmm. saying, let there be strong voices from the South. Let us show them how to sing in these languages through, um, you know, telling them our techniques and our IPA and all of that. Let's, let's yes. hear more about that. No, co completely. Um, and, and you have, you have um, scholars like there's Hugh, there's Kubik, and there's Andrew that I studied about um, during my lit lit literature review, my chapter two of uh, my study. And what they say is that the South African education system should implement the teaching of the African technique of singing and thus include the teaching of African music notation. So now the notation and the notating of African music is also quite important. Uh, now there's obviously within our very own. And they, they continue to claim that formal musical education should rely on an increase in the effective writing of African music. So the more African music is written, the more it is notated, the more the African technique is also, uh, you know, taken on and is also, you know, tried to, uh, to basically be, be, be taught. Now, another scholar uh, that came through was Heike, um, you know, uh, uh, who then came through to argue that, uh, you know, choral music education in South Africa are factors that provide a means of fostering segregation and obviously developing ethnic identity, unquote. Although the 1996 white paper had a lot to do with observing the structures of how composers should compose indigenized operas in South Africa, this was Hilda Rose who says this, it did not influence the growth of more black opera singers seen on permanent stages around South Africa, nor teaching of the African type of singing. So, so obviously not having more black majority singers on stage then really meant that ah, then was the case for us to then teach people how to, you know, sing in the African technique, because we're not going to be singing any, you know, any um, uh, South African operas anyway. So why do we, why is there a need for that? However, there is so much of a need for it to happen. Now, government strategies mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre-1994 did not provide opera with enough mass support and sustainability in South Africa, which then perhaps that was another dilemma, that uh, problem that came through. Now, in order for one to include indigenized music in opera, there needs to be going back, like you've mentioned, and understand the way in which our music is sung. I, I think I find this exciting. I, I really find your contribution very exciting because I think what it also begins to do is to say you cannot be in a music school without studying African music. And um, if there is a likelihood of you being a composer, you also yeah. have to study in these indigenous uh, musical forms um, into, into your compositions, which means anybody who decides to compose an opera within the African context or South African context needs to have gone through understanding vendor music, yeah. vendor traditional music, Kosa traditional music, Zulu traditional music, how to sing Amahobo, um, how, how Mogolo sounds, and, and the harmonies and, and the, how the, the, the words are used in these different styles of music, which then means uh, probably, or maybe def most definitely, that opera schools should have very strong ethnomusicology programs or very strong African music uh, programs. What do you say? What is your take on that? You are completely correct. Uh, because then when, you, when we have that, then you're obviously broadening up the scope. You know, if we want to learn about, uh, you know, the vendor tradition and, and how the music is sung, then by the time you get into, uh, you know, your, your singing lesson with the teacher, you already have a background of how their dialects are used. If, uh, you know, there's any speech inflections and if there's any any other thing like that. And I'm so happy you mentioned that because Hilda Ross also mentioned that um, if musicians and composers of opera are to include or sing music in a specific tradition, of opera, we need to learn the way in which the music of that tradition is notated as well, right? Um, and how the melodic and the rhythmic patterns, you know, are sung as well. So it's quite important what you're mentioning, uh, Mr. Bogwana. And uh, I, I really hope that, you know, somehow, you know, some somewhat it, it, it will be implemented. It's just obviously very fickle at the moment to even, you know, there's a conversation about would you, would you let you know, uh, would you advise someone to go study opera with, with how the, you know, how opera at the moment in South Africa looks like? 
But I really suggest that if we would have something like African technique in schools, then I really think something would would be done. I think you know we, you 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 would you would even have more black majority of audiences coming in and to watch you know um uh, um the, this music. I don't know if you would want me to go into some of the characteristics as well before moving on. Okay, let me let me, let me just uh, maybe mention something that I, I was thinking through as you were talking, that maybe maybe it's time to move away from thinking about opera versus choral music versus, and maybe we should just simply think about African vocality, which whereby African vocality then simply means understanding ways of singing, understanding the voice yeah. within an African context, and we basically just uh, present all the all the genres, all the style. Yes. As found in Africa, or at least as found in South Africa, and we study their characteristics, and we and we we, we study their histories, we study their repertoires, so that ultimately, if you are presenting, you say you are a soloist in an opera that is based on vendor music, you know exactly how to sing in the style of vendor music, um, in the style of uh, the vendor vocal traditions, and and you understand the rhythmic structures, you understand the um, the slight nuances that are captured or that you sh one should be able to capture in vendor music and Zulu music and all that, which means we need to reorient reorient it the way we, we, we learn music in South Africa because sometimes you are in this vocal arts class where basically the first thing you do is the Ariantike and then you do your Mozart and all that and you do your leader. And if ever you have to do any African music, sometimes it comes as a choice in other schools, and therefore you just do a term of it and it's all over. And so I think maybe we need to ch challenge the music departments into really um, creating a space where everybody within these music schools learns African music and learns uh, the characteristics of African music, and also maybe learns how to compose Using or following that. traditional di uh, di uh, dynamics. Yeah. Not I, completely. Yeah, you I, were. You were. You were uh, okay. Cutting. All right. No, no. I think I think I've 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 given. So, go yeah, go, so go ahead and, and 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 give us the characteristics you wanted to talk about. All right, but but I just wanted to to touch on uh, you know some of the you you spoke largely and and it's beautiful that that you mentioned you know you know what what you've mentioned because the National Choir Festival last year um, what they did was to include more music, um, more choral work that is that is composed in South Africa, and by African uh, you know composers, and I think their vision was so clear that uh, they they even stopped doing the whole uh, western section and african section i think we had something different last year and and i uh, and for them it was it was mostly to have we had accompanied and unaccompanied instead of western and african uh, categories and i think for them it was a matter of uh, even if you, you you pick you know any 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 song if it's African as, as a conductor, uh, then you deal with either it's accompanied or unaccompanied because it, it forms part of, uh, you know, the um, characteristics of, of African music. So by talking about these characteristics um, that are typical to indigenous African music, the choral music practice of South African black composers uh, in particular. Now, the general question obviously would be, you know, uh, generally the general characteristics uh, um, and indigenous African rhythm, the indigenous African melody, uh, the harmonies, the texture, the structure as well. Now, rhythm, as we know it, is determined by the speech pattern, um, you know, of the particular spoken language. So in this view, if you say, so on, so obviously, then that's why we have those glissandos when you, when you are composing, uh, you know, starting from uh, obviously from 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 the, the, you know uh, uh, a higher tension and going down the you know the slope like that. Now, influenced by the speech rhythm, several authors on African music, especially uh, the ones who borrowed Western style of composing when studying African music, what they ended up doing, they ended up suggesting that African music is polyrhythmic. And because you know it's full of uh, of, of cross rhythm 
and so on. Now, this is all because uh, they could not figure out the plethora of rhythms that occur simultaneously, you know, uh, in, in a single performance. Because now they, they try to figure out these rhythms that are happening, but they ended up saying, you no, know, it's polyrhythmic because of, of you know, uh, um, um, you know, one will start with, with, uh, with the type of rhythm and the other rhythm will come in, uh, you know, simultaneously. Now, it, it invariably involved aspects such as the dancing, the music that we have, it's dancing, it's the singing, it's the hand clapping, it's the acting, uh, the percussion that comes in as well. And obviously, uh, different interpolations that come in from the audience as well. You ended up having the audience clapping and coming in while someone is doing Indlamu on stage, you know, which is another amazing form of, uh, you know, having uh, uh, more African operas on stage. You have the audience participating. Why? Because they understand what's going on. They fully get it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so uh, dealt with the rhythm, now coming to the melody of African music, it is generally not long. Melodies are never so long. They're usually repeated resulting in cyclic nature described as the biachere. Now, I'm going to stop there just a little bit because um, when, I, when I was defending my study, I think it was my first colloquial, one of the questions that came across um, from my, my, that was my, my very first supervisor who had then resigned from TUT and he had come into my, my colloquial and he asked me a question that even today... I beat myself on because I'm thinking it's something that, and this is someone who's not in, in the choral or even, or even, you know, opera sphere, but does more traditional Isuzulu culture. And he mm -hmm. asked me, when are we going to start having our own vocabulary, our music vocab, own African music vocab? Where Allegretto, we know what Allegretto is in Isuzulu or Isikosa or Ichivenda. Because I don't believe when Mtatim Zilega is um, you know, or Mr. Pelan, when, when they write, I'm not so certain, you, 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 you'll just correct me there, that they have sort of the African, uh, you know, type of, uh, of, of writing only when it comes to, you know, uh, um, say, say how the music needs to go in the score, the Alegretos, you know, Portamento and all of that. Right, let me check in there. Um, yeah. I know, for instance, that Kalilani does that. Um, think, uh, terms like Allegro al 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 Manon he would say Ula um, Kamazeli, yeah. which means don't take it too fast. I, I really think all African composers in 2020 going forward can actually yeah. change the Italian because those Italian terms are really Italian terms for activities that uh, denote tempo. So, yeah, if you're saying not too fast, in course, I could easily be um, yes. if you if if you want um, soft, which is really very muted singing, there definitely is a word for that in this course. So, I think one of the ways to Africanize is really just to begin to use African terms, um, maybe something like quasa. Or yeah. in Cholo or something like that, and if you want soft, um, some or you know, th that could be a starting point. I think I think what is really exciting about this conversation is that it, it's challenging people to think about many ways to introduce aspects of Africanness, and there's not just a single way of being African in 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 in, in your choral or operatic um, repertoires. Um, you can start with the language, you can start with the performance and expression and tempi marks uh, of expressions. Um, you can start with a storyline that is taken from maybe an old dramatic play in the in, in, in Isisutu or in Isikoso. But in addition to that, you can then get into the technical um, music elements, such as the call and response that you spoke about. And there are varieties of this call and response. And you can look at... Um, your understanding of the indigenous languages prosody um, following the speech tone patterns. Um, once you understand the prosodic nature of, of some of these languages and you show that you try to carry that in the music, in the singing, those are the many things that um, our composers can start doing. But also think, um, 
you know, Ruth Stone in her in her discussion of, of African music and its its quality that its characteristics. She raises the fact that sometimes it's even difficult when you're dealing with African music to dissect it in terms of um, music as, as, as voice and music as instrumentation and music as dance and music as attire because they all happen together sometimes. And I think this is where opera, African opera becomes very exciting to me because you can bring all these elements of the, the visual um, the musical, the 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 the, the movement um, onto the stage, mm. and 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 even sometimes the poetic traditions of the imagine imagine is um, alongside mm. a, a form of dancing on stage with the costume and of course all the operatic singing. I think I think I think opera really is, or rather the emergence of opera, African opera. It really challenges us to go back to our um, musical and performing traditions. Completely. And I'm so, I'm so happy that you, you touched on that, especially, uh, you know, uh, tapped into the um, notating of, of, of the music itself, uh, and, and, you know, just uh, having it dotted down, you know, you know, you know for us. Uh, because uh, Heike, which uh, another, um, you know, academic, uh, in 2010, she, she said that uh, elements found in African music include the ryth rhythm, complexity, pentatonic or modal tonality, overlapping call and response, like we mentioned, um, perca percussive quality and inflections, uh, you know, dictated by African speech tones. Now, Tracy and Kubik et al., um, they mentioned that the teaching of the three common chords that are known, which is obviously the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant, the primary triads, in conjunction with the tonic sulfur in most African schools, has in some ways widely overshadowed the authenticity of the correct harmony. And some of these elements are found in Western styles of composing operatic music, which I thought what they were trying to say is that if you're gonna bring in, you know, um, the the subdominance the, the, the you know these uh the the, the three uh, you know uh, types of uh, of notating then and i understand that our composers were really just probably trying to see how they can compose our own music using the westernized type but then it was seen seen as a way of uh, you know taking away actually from what African music is really all about. You know, it doesn't really necessarily take from, uh, you know, the Western culture and as much as obviously, you know, some of it and um, um, especially some of the choral works have taken from, from that. Now, African music lends itself to improvisation. We know this, we've seen it and can also borrow Western harmonies as a form of enhancing the music, right? Now, there's another person, Dromo, who argues the fact that because it is so improvised, African music cannot be notated, which leads to um, indigenous music being disadvantaged without a method of, uh, you know, uh, preserving and disseminating it as well. Now, which I think, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that could be done, it's something that is obviously able to be done. And, and I'm talking largely about the, the notating of, of our African music so that, so that by going back, like you've mentioned, Mr. Vokwana, we are then able to, to have, uh, you know, uh, in schools, more African technique that is taught. Because now pentatonic scales are found in, you know, in African music as well. Now the use of the pentatonic scale is, uh, is very quite common among the different languages groups and, you know, um, um, uh, just in Africa as a whole. Another scholar uh, was quoted by Prof Mukobani. Uh, Law Bamjoko identifies four scales. That's the texatonic, the pentatonic, the hexatonic, and the heptatonic, which I believe are some of, you know, um, the uh, structures, uh, some of the scales that can be taught when it comes to the African technique. Instead of, instead of, of just your, 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 your normal, uh, you know, G, G major scale, uh, you know, or the minor scale, you can then have the pentatonic scales being taught, the hexatonic scales being taught, so that by the time you have an African type of uh, music score that you have, you already know or you can already hear it. Like we do every time when when you hear, you know, a, a piano playing, you already know that oh, oh my God, that's that's a that's a that's a major scale being played, or that is a, a you know a, um, a a minor scale being played. Now, 
uh, uh, Tracy was quoted by Drummore mentions that and argues that African music is orally transmitted and is simple in structure, basically, therefore making it easier to notate. And Drummore then says indigenous African music is considered complex because of the cross rhythms I've spoken about. Uh, the sliding tones are not easy to notate. However, as an oral tradition, this music is simple. I don't know what you think about that. Do you think the music is simple to notate? Or do you think that there'll, there'll be difficulties, obviously? I think one of the challenges is that all, all forms of notation are not always accurate. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 I mean, even stuff, not, even stuff notation um, might not necessarily tell you anything about the timbre of the music that is being notated or the expressive elements. So notation is simply a language for coding sounds, but it's not always um, perfectly um, perfectly representative of the kinds of sounds that are being produced. So I think um, in addition to the, the systems of notation that already exist, I think composers when they work um, can also devise and improvise as they go along, maybe Maybe if you feel that this is how I want to 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 represent the glides and the upward glide, and then you you devise your own um, you devise your own um, symbol, and if you want to devise a particular um, timbre quality, you you devise your own um, symbol for that. But I also think um, you know with within this time of uh, of of the fourth industrial revolution, composition can no longer only be on paper, sorry, not composition, but notation. And, and so I think one can use other um, media to say, well, this note that I've put here kind of represents um, this in, 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 in writing. And then you put whatever it is that you have put in writing against what it is that you are trying to to, to, to represent, whether it's a sound you've heard or it's a sound you can produce for yourself so that people can actually read your score side by side with what has been recorded, you know? Um, so I think, I think what, what, what really remains important is that going forward, um, African composers must think of ways in which to notate the traditional musics. Um, and also think of ways to develop new systems, um, new signs, new symbols um, to represent the African sounds. But I also think going back to that conversation on the 145, um, it's quite a limiting and a very problematic codal structure and, and a harmonic configuration within um, most choral pieces. And I think it's quite important that just about everybody who is working on choral music and opera in this country needs to understand that there's actually musical life beyond the one, four, five of the of the diatonic scale, um, you know, system, and the related um, harmonic structures and resolutions and tensions and all that. But I also think what most universities don't really get to do when people get taught music theory is that people are never in, introduced to things like the pentatonic scales as found in different parts of Africa, because it's not just one type of a pentatonic scale, you know, there are different types. And also the, 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 the modes. I think, I think there's so much miseducation that has happened as a result of if people were to feel that, you know what, I really just want to compose um, the way vendor music sounds, because the vendor music is not proceeding along the lines of one, four, five um, chordal progression, then a composer finds himself not knowing what to do. But also I think the idea of always thinking in four-part harmony instead of maybe mm. two-part or three-part, which is what sometimes happens um, harmonically in, in traditional musics, that once we begin to realize that traditional music does not have to subscribe to the uh, four-part Mm -hmm. structure of soprano alto female um, maybe singing in unison or other I think our composers can find forms of being liberated mm. no completely you, you're completely 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 right and and thank you so much for, for that as well I think uh, you, you've just sparked something 
you know, for me right now, and I think it's something that perhaps I can learn from as well. What do you think, uh, say, let, let's just say, you know, um, if, if also you're able to help out, the let's talk about maybe the, the basic, um, say, type of uh, technique that, that we, we could sort of start teaching um, in our schools. Because in, in Italian, you, you have the bel canto style, obviously. And now, which is obviously an Italian vocal, vocal technique um, from the 18th century. Now, they, they use obviously what they call the si canta come si parla, which is one sings as they speak, in which in African culture, also, it's the same thing. And, and, and when the music is, is notated, also, it's, 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 it's the same thing. The Babu Nomiya would you obviously do it also himself. You know where he takes, you know, uh, it's his little dialect, and and when he composes the, the you know, uh, the melody then has to sound like that, and then you have they have the opening the throat, uh, you know, type of singing, obviously, uh, palatal and uh, pharyngeal as well that they use, um, obviously that's lifting up of the soft palate, lowering the larynx, and assuming you know the ideal position, of, you know, of articulation as well, uh, you know, the jaws, the lips and the tongue as well, um, as the shaping of the mouth and the use of facial expressions as well. What do you think could be, if, if you can help us out, just the one that we can start teaching in schools? Is there is there a, a you know, some, some type of, uh, say, maybe, because, because I think with African, with African music, it would be more broad because then there's the different cultures that we have. Perhaps, you know, if, if you would have to, let's take Tonga, for instance. How would you then, you know, um, notate or, or write music for the Tongas when they have a whistle-like, when they when they speak, they do have a sort of a, a whistle-like, you know, zona, zona, you know, so much. How would you then uh, notate that? And how would you then teach, you know, someone in, in, in a music class that type of singing? Right. Um... <clears throat> I think I think one of the challenges that um, are there for us in South African Academy, you know, elsewhere in the world, if you're studying voice, um, you you are trained to be to to learn German, Italian, and French, not only just in class in the in. The, this singing class also as language to, to, to face it is that because there are kind of three or four categories of, of South African languages, the Nguni um, group and the, the Tswana Sutu group and then the, the Pedian vendor. I think one of the starting points would be that, um, you know, there are people who develop um, an understanding of the IPA in in the in the mm -hmm. in the Nguni tradition and IPA in the Tswana Sutu tradition, and also all, all language groups and IPA in Venda and Tonga. And then I think there are certain principles that 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 are standard in singing. For instance, the idea of singing as you speak. Um, then then once you understand. These these local languages, we start singing and we start singing songs. We start singing arias. We start singing um, art songs that are composed in these languages, and I think that's where we can then begin to develop principles. Which means two things here need to happen. A place like TUT needs to commission each year, Mr. Tamizungu needs to have a budget to commission local composers to have arias in their local languages, because then you cannot develop a pedagogy of African singing if there are no African songs to sing. So you're not going to use um, Tosa-based vocal pedagogy on an Italian piece. So there needs to be a Tosa aria, there needs to be a Shitonga aria first. So which means now, um, going forward, we need to develop repertoires in these languages as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And once there is significant repertoire in these languages, we can then maybe also, um, as music departments, interact with 
people in language development to develop an IPA. Um, well, I think I think all the South African languages actually do have an IPA. So you work hand in hand with linguists just to figure out if um, you know the, the the elements of the IPA are, 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 are adhered to when people are singing in these languages. And then I think a combination, maybe kind of um, a combined research activity between voice trainers or voice teachers and language people to modify the IPA in relation to the vocal modifications that happen across the range. That, you know, um, for, for the voice to sound a particular way at this range or this register, then this is how you might want to modify um, a particular uh, vowel. So I think, I think if we were to start thinking more long-term, firstly, get the repertoire. And then as soon as you get the repertoire, the teachers themselves need to challenge themselves, which means a person like you, if you've got a singing studio, you need to understand how to send a sound. I do know that you are, you, you speak Sitswana and Tosa and, but maybe you do not know the house event vendor sounds. So, um, and also as a, 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 a vendor teacher needs to understand Tosa sounds and all that, which means as teachers in music schools in South Africa, we need to challenge ourselves. Um, for me, I, I wouldn't really think necessarily about a particular technique, but rather the resource from which to develop the technique. And that okay. resource is the presence of songs to sing and be able then to say, this is how a Kosa song will sound. If you are doing this to a Kosa song, you're distorting the language, you're distorting the, um, the, the, the prosody and all that. And then that's when we'll begin to theorize about ways to teach, um, ways to teach and ways to develop um, African elements in, in, in the art songs that we'll, we will have produced. Completely. That is. Thank you so much for that, and I'm hoping that you know uh, the relevant people are also you know uh, tuning in and listening to the to the conversation because that could be a beautiful starting point as well. Because for me, I, you know, I really think if if you're saying it could be introduced at the vocal arts, uh, you, you know, section of performing arts at TUT, and because productions then happen around June, July, so you have an entire first half of the year to if if because th there are there is music out there, you know, um, but obviously we need more. Um, and if we could start maybe say from February, um, start teaching, say if we're gonna do a ihubo or do um, any, any, any type of African singing that will be done at vocal art, maybe for a production, then you start teaching the language from March up, until right up to the production happens and obviously afterwards as well. So by the time, you know, a production is is, is starting is set and it, this production is an easy tosa, then you know from class what you've learned and you'll be able to implement it in the type of singing as well, I, I suggest. So that's very true, Bongani. But, but, but I also think sometimes we use um, terms like African music, which are kind of problematic. What is African music? Yeah. Africa is 700 million people, if not more. Completely. Africa is 54, 55 continents. Uh, sorry, countries, not continents. Um, Africa is all sorts of things. So I think some, and also within just one language, one language, yeah. one ethnic group. So sometimes they are different types of songs and dances. I think, I, think, I think for me, one of the things that we might want to do is that, or maybe one of the greatest things that has happened is the fact that in some of these music schools, we have ethnic um, or indigenous or native teachers, um, whatever is, could be the right word. Because a person like Mr. Zungu, would know that when he commissions Udadu uh, Smisi to write a song, he might say to him in one year, whatever area you are writing for us, for soprano, it must have an element of Amaho. Yes. Because Zulus, the Zulu culture, one of the forms of um, vo vo vocality is Amaho, but it's not the only one. And so mm. in one year, he might say, 
Um, whatever it is that you are writing, can it be um, in show that it is inspired by even Omas Kandi, or it's inspired yeah. by Ishtameni, um, maybe within the Kosa group, um, write something that is clearly, um, you know, maybe write a, an ensemble that will have a section that shows that it is inspired by Umungo, it is inspired by, um, you know, other forms of singing, so that when we then teach and when we then develop techniques, we don't just simply say things like, this is a Zulu technique, because I don't mm. think all types of Zulu music are sung in the same way, because I they're hear, quite different. And, and similarly, you know, um, within the Kosa people, there are different ways of singing, depending on what, 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 what one is singing. And what this really does is that, I, I, think, I think over time we will have started our generation of, of, of pedagogues, of academics within these music departments, will have started a movement that will be culminated in 300 years to come, which is exactly what has happened with, with, with European uh, vocal traditions. But we are here to lay the groundwork. We are here to develop songs, um, arias, um, operas that take into consideration the different styles of singing of our people. Mm. Beautiful. You really said a mouthful, and 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 I think also you you the mentioning of uh, you know African music being broad and not just Isi Zulu and Isi Kosa as well. So it, it it'll obviously have to be you know be taken one year at a time, then you know if if uh, to be taught because then 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 you, you can have someone also uh, you know uh, producing a, a, a say work in in. Uh, you know, in the Zimbabwean language, you know, of the, um, in the, 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 the native language that they Shona. use as well. Uh, Shona. In, Shona, in Shona, and have music mm -hmm. from, from North Africa or have, uh, you know, uh, music from, from Uganda that, that, that we, we, you know, uh, can be, because there is music, I, I, I believe, that, that, you know, some, some composers have also composed. So, so it's interesting that you think that because it, it's gonna be broad, but it can literally be be brought in and done. And when when if it, it can be done well, then it can be able to be executed. And I think the reasoning, the reason why this hasn't been done, I think, is because people are listening so much to what other people are saying about the difficulty of having to have this African technique being implemented. And I really think if it could be started on, and and if we really can all come together without one trying to pull the other, without one trying to sound, uh, you know, uh, more educated than the other one, it could really work. You know, one thing about Americans that I, that I like, and, and I know I'm going to sound really out of line, is that Americans are, are able to fake something and make you believe that it's, it's something that they have and it's something that is happening to them and they stick to it. It's like they have an entire WhatsApp group and say, we are going with this and that's it, you know? And you have then Tina Africans where someone will say this and would want to fight it and want to argue it and want to, you know, divulge in it and then it ends up not going anywhere. So if we can really just have it and have it started off, there's, there's so many, we have, we have people that have studied, we have ethnologists that we have, we have musicologists, we have, all of these things that we can actually create one syllabus that can work for everyone. Um, I, I, I think also we can, we can be very deliberate about as institutions. Like if yeah. TUT decides that, you know what, for the next three years, yeah. we're going to be delivering, we're, we're going to be concentrated, concentrating on Zulu repertoires and maybe, sure. you know, and, and, and therefore, over the next three years, we're going to produce um, 20 songs um, composed by Zulu composers only. And, and maybe another three years, we're going to get into the Venn tradition. Or a university like UKZN can decide that, you know, we're just commissioning Zulu composers. This is, yeah, we are in KZN and, and, yeah. and we've got a wealth of Zulu composers. And another person in Porch might decide yes. that, you know what, we're in a Tswana speaking area. Our interest is really going to be commissioning work Completely. that are in this area and using the language in this area. And, and over five years, you then have 
five or ten or twelve or twelve or fifteen or twenty songs that are in each of the languages and 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 then we begin to interrogate how they sound how they should sound how they can be taught so i think i think maybe the next step is to really just have a conference to talk about these things um so that we can figure out uh, the, the whole range of possibilities um, unfortunately, Bongani, you, I, we, I have to give you a, a few closing remarks because um, um, time has, you know, time has come to an end. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Bogwana, and uh, thank you so much for, you know, obviously, Mr. Buson Jeza as well for having me on the Coral List today. And really, uh, you know, I, I even feel much better that I've released this out to the world. And I'm hoping that, you know, uh, the more relevant people as well were, were listening in and they're able to sort of take take on and um, I think we'll, we'll just have to then see how we can go forward with it and have a, a, a broader, you know, conversation with it. Um, and just, you know, to conclude by saying that, that that conference that you're talking about is indeed needed. And when that conference is done, then we execute, we go forward and we, we get to implement this African type of technique, which is quite important. You know, I think for many years, folks have been trying to, uh, you know, get into it. And I think we are the generation to start it off. I agree totally. I think I think we it's it's time to really um, present what Africa has and what Africa consists of. But also, it's time to really, really just interrogate things much more um, intensely, so that we ask ourselves what which Africa is this that we're talking about? Because I think there are many constituents of what Africa is. There are many languages, there are many musical styles, there are many instruments, there are many rhythms, there are many all sorts of other things. And I think once we begin to interrogate what we mean by Africa, but also try to implement aspects of Africanness in our music, I think we'll be much richer. And really this is this speaks to the whole um, movement of decoloniality of voices from the South within the Academy. Um, it's quite exciting really to be a practicing musician and a practicing music academic in South Africa at this moment. And it's conversations like these that keep us going. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for um, the questions that um, you've probably asked. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, Mr. Njeza will be back. Thank you. Bye-bye. Greetings to Bye -bye. you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manja Kala, commonly known as Power, conductor of United Choral Artists, WA, and Injong Primary School Choir. Please feel free to watch the Choralist Hour with Smusi Sonjeza every Thursday at 7 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube channel.